Welcome to the Ad Nauseum Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listeners, to episode 45 of the Odd Nauseam Podcast. My name is Dr. Jeff Winkle, and I'm here in the vomitorium, as I almost always am, no, always am, with my good friend and co-host, Dr. David Noe. How you doing, Dave? I'm doing great, Jeff. Thanks for asking. I can hardly control my excitement over here. Yeah, you're kind of, you're, you're almost jittery and I'm a little jumpy. A yeah. We get to talk to Ross King today. Who's Ross King? Ross King is a New York Times best-selling author of incredible books that combine personal insight with deep research and an extensive knowledge of Renaissance painting and architecture and history. This guy does it all. He does it, it all. And it's, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And it's so accessible to his, his stuff. It reads like just a great novel. Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's, I don't know how he, how he threads that needle. And maybe, well, maybe he'll explain it. Today. We're going to find out today, I think, a little bit. You know, it was many, many years ago when I read the first of the books of uh, King that I've read, Brunelleschi's Dome. I was blown away. Yeah. Absolutely blown away. And since then, I've slowly been reading uh, the other works in his corpus. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Same, same here. I think it was our friend and, and former colleague, Ken Bratt, who he lent me Brunelleschi's Dome. I had not heard of Ross King before. And I had just been to Florence and seen the dome. And I read this book, was blown away, and I was I was kicking myself for not having read the book before. Precisely, I went. yeah. And I have an anecdote along those lines that we're going to bring up when Ross gets on the air with us here in just a minute. Yeah, uh, to talk about that kind of thing. But it is uh, it's amazing that we were able to get him as a guest. Had I known that we were going to end up talking to Ross King, <laughs> we just started this podcast years ago. Seriously, seriously. But the wonders of the those interwebs, people are accessible in ways that you you don't even dream of. No, it's, it's really something. It's, really, it's cool. Right. But let's get to our shout out today. Um, are, you, are you gonna do the shout out? I am. Okay, yeah. this, this goes to uh, a wonderful young woman named Julia Vandermolen. So Julia was a student of both yours and mine. Yes. And she says she'd be tickled to be shouted out to on uh, ad nauseum. And she's coming to us from Hudsonville, Michigan, nearby. And uh, she says, quote, she's way too modest, but she says, my only real claim to fame is that I've had you both as professors. Maybe the only mathematics major who can say that? Yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that really impressed me about Julia is that I, I think she's, she went on to further her education Definitely. In, in mathematics. Yes. Um, but she was one of those, those Renaissance women. She, she studied Greek. Yes. She studied Latin. And she could do math at a high level. Right. And she, she was a very good student for us, too. Phenomenal. Yep. And uh, went with us on our trip to Greece in yes. 2011. That's right. Yes. Just uh, so grateful, Julia, that you're listening and supporting the podcast. Yeah. And uh, thanks for being that kind of Renaissance woman who keeps these interests alive, even if it's not your main vocation. It's an important avocation. Indeed. So thank you. Indeed. Uh, so we are just so thrilled that you are here. <laughs> we're, we're really grateful. Um, we email a number of persons whose work we admire and, and think it's interesting. And, you know, they don't always write back, to be honest. <laughs> I always find it odd that, you know, I've, uh, you know, over my professional career, I've contacted various people, uh, often not asking onerous duties of them, and they don't respond. Right. I'm never yeah. sure what to make, make of that, whether they're so busy they don't see it, uh, or whether they're just contemptuous of all such requests. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not to make my myself or you sound too cheap, but I just say yes to everyone. So, ah, oh. well, that's yeah, very generous. Yeah, both David and I are. I mean, we're we're huge fans of your work. I don't think I've ever read all of your books. No, but um, getting pretty, close, pretty close. <laughs> there, yes, there's quite a few of them. So, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure there's anyone who's read all of them. <laughs> oh, certainly you have, right? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so, well, although some of them I've not read for a long time. So, hmm. Hmm. Yeah. well, the first one that I read was uh, Brunelleschi's Dome. And then uh, just recently for my birthday, uh, my wife said, you know, what, what do you want for your birthday? I said, well, I want the book on Leonardo and the Last Supper. And it just appeared like magic. So, oh, <laughs> well, you, you have very good taste and uh, so I'm very <laughs> glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> 
So as we get started, we have a, a series of, of questions and so forth to maybe guide and shape the conversation a little bit. Jeff, you want to start out with this? Sure. So um, the podcast that Dave and I do this ad nauseum is largely focused on the, the classical world, the ancient Greek and Roman world. Also, its uh, its reception in later in later centuries to the present day. And so kind of the, the big question that we've uh, asked as version of this question of, of almost everybody we've interviewed is, in what ways have the classics, the study of the classics, your knowledge of the classics, your education in the classics, um, whatever it might be, how has that shaped your career, your writing, your life, the, um, your, your thinking? If you, could just, if you could start there, that would be great. Sure. Well, I should begin by confessing I don't have an education in the classics as such, or I don't have an ed- education. Uh, my, my degree was in something completely different. Uh, from anything I've gone on to do, or my right. degrees rather. Um, my undergraduate were uh, in English literature and history, and my graduate degrees are in English literature, and specifically 18th century English literature, oh, yeah. uh, which I have not worked on uh, and not even really thought a lot about, I guess we could say, since the day I defended my thesis, which was <laughs> many years ago. Mm. And so I, w- I went on uh, to do other things. So I guess I'm an autodidact in some way mm. in sure. the fields of study that I've eventually come to. So when did you first visit Florence? Because obviously Florence is the main character in at least each of the novels of yours that I've read. When When is your first experience in Florence? It was in the mid 90s. So we're going back uh, some 25 years, um, and I had moved uh, from Canada, where I had done my studies, and I uh, moved to London uh, because I was going to uh, have my rough Canadian edges sanded off the <laughs> British finishing school education. And then I would, uh, you know, if all had gone well, I would have gone back to Canada and walked and up and down in front of eager young students and, mm. and taught them. But It was not to be. Um, And uh, so I I loved England, so I stayed here. Uh, But I also loved the continent. And suddenly it was, I realized I could be in Florence in one hour and 45 minutes. Mm. And so I started going quite often in the mid to late 90s. And my eureka moment, in some ways the eureka moment for my career, was climbing the dome in Florence, climbing Ah. up the... 463 steps to the top and standing at the top and looking out over Florence, but more to the point, looking at what was under my feet, which I could not understand how it could possibly stay up this uh, magnificent dome and how much less it could have all of the massive marble uh, that was behind me uh, that rises above the dome, how it could support that. Right. So I was interested in finding out how how this was done, uh, finding out any history I could get from it. Um, and I realized anyone who had my questions had two options. Either you could read a paragraph in a guidebook about Filippo Brunelleschi and the building the dome, uh, which, as I realized, ultimately, uh, most of these were wrong. But I also, you know, your other thing was a, a giant, textbook, uh, a massively thick textbook that was almost impossible to read. So right. um, so I decided there has to be something for someone like me who wants uh, wants to get into it without, you know, without either being short, short changed as knowledge or without, right. you know, a migraine headache from mm-hmm. trying to read this massive tome. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What I really remember from that book is uh, Brunelleschi's competition with Gilberti, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. Over the Gates of Paradise, the famous egg story, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, and and then the other the the wonderful anecdote you had about one of the also rans in the competition was let's fill the entire space with soil uh, laced with coins, and then we'll have the people come in <laughs> and remove after the dome is constructed. Th- those little gems that permeate all of your writing, uh, they're so useful. Uh, as a teacher and just, you know, someone who's interested in the material. You know, those are, who knows if some of those stories are true. Sure. <laughs> the dirt could be true because they, you know, if, if we think about it, how how did you su- build a support network if you're mm-hmm. building a dome or an arch? And one easy way to do it was pile up to pile up dirt or sand to 100 feet or 200 feet, something like that. Um, and then you had to decenter it. So you had to somehow pull get this massive material back out. Uh, and 
Uh, and so it may well have been the case that um, someone suggested when this plan was put forward that they put coins into it so that the population of Florence would eagerly come out <laughs> on a treasure hunt with their little buckets and spades and begin scooping. Right, uh, right. I mean, what one of the things I'm the beneficiary of is this great uh, tradition of storytelling um, and tall, tall tale telling that went on in Florence for uh, decades and indeed centuries after Brunelleschi, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, all of these people that I write about. Mm. So was that that moment on, on, on top of the dome, was that also kind of more or less when you saw yourself, well, I'm not going to go the traditional academic route and I'm going to do something else? Uh, or how did that how did that 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 change come? In some ways, that decision was made for me by mm. uh, I'm, I'm envious of the pair of you to have uh, of, of, you know, jobs at a university. And uh, <laughs> because I felt stateless for a long time. In fact, I mm. some ways still do. And the fact that I live my life much as I did when I was a student uh, makes it so I do sort of feel like I haven't really moved on from my grad student days. Which <laughs> was a, yeah. You know, was my choice. Not I spent. I think it was 14 happy years in university before I was forcibly ejected. I had done about every degree it was possible to do. And so, but the decision was made because back in those days, the mid nineties, it was difficult to, I mean, I, I think it's difficult today as well. That it might even be. It's worse now. Yeah. At a, mm -hmm. uh, a, a job. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, um, I mean, had I stuck with it, perhaps I now would be a, you know, occupying a distinguished chair at a prestigious university or something like mm -hmm. that. <laughs> Have you gotten offers? I mean, given the popularity of your work? No, uh, not really. No. no? Um, sadly, no. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I <laughs> anyone is out there, with, if there's an empty chair somewhere, <laughs> I'm happy well, to walk you. <laughs> yeah. But you, your work is, is so delightful, frankly, that a tremendous amount of impact on a lot of people. Here's just one anecdote story that, um, I think demonstrates this. So four years ago, when I was uh, I was in Rome and leading some students, and uh, because it was a student group, I was able to tour them through the Sistine Chapel, right? And I had visited four or five times, but I had never been the person responsible for explaining it. And so I was very anxious. And so the, all the days leading up, I'm, I'm pouring over Michelangelo in the Pope's ceiling, taking notes, you know, rehearsing, what am I going to say? And then, you know, there with book in hand, here's my big moment. And, you know, the press of crowds there, of course, it's impossible to say anything, but uh, you, you have that impact on a lot of people. So that's... Um, that's uh, very good to hear um, because, you know, so, so often uh, as you write, uh, you don't know who you're writing for. Sure. Mm. Uh, or you don't know if anyone's going to read you. And so... It, I mean, that's one of the uh, good things about giving talks and lectures and things like that is you actually meet your readers and find right, out right. what how what was useful to them and mm -hmm. and and you know maybe what I could do in the next book for them as well. So right, now, Ross. It says on your uh, Wikipedia page, and these these things aren't always uh, true, but it says that from time to time you give tours of the Duomo in Florence. Is that is that right? Yeah. Um, yes, I've linked up with I've linked up with uh, uh, you know a couple of organizations. One in Florence called Friends of Florence, which is a charity mm -hmm. uh, uh, which raises money for the preservation of works of art in Florence and Tuscany more generally. And so, as part of the fundraisers, uh, you know, people come to Florence uh, and we climb the dome and mm. look in the cathedral, go around the Uffizi, uh, look at churches in Florence, and. Then sometimes do programs which take us uh, to the Sistine Chapel or to mm -hmm. Milan to the Last Supper and things mm -hmm. like that. And I work with the Smithsonian and, you know, various groups to um, uh, sort of spread what I think is my enthusiasm for for Italy, for uh, Italian culture, uh, for mm -hmm. the art of the art and learning the Renaissance. Um, and so it's well, just fortunate that, um, you know, I'm able to do it. Uh, in person as well as <laughs> writing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That enthusiasm certainly comes through in the writing. That that's for sure. Uh, how do you, how do you balance the, the erudition elements of the volumes that you write? Because there's some, some obvious deep research there. How do you balance those elements with the narrative uh, novelization storytelling elements? Because that thread really maintains people's interest, I think, quite quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a fine line because they're I'm you know very reliant on 
on academics and scholars, uh, you know, both uh, from the last, you know, or, you know, contemporary ones who have been publishing the last year or two, uh, but also people who over the past century or past couple of centuries have done work uh, in the area. But most of them or virtually all of them, especially academics writing today, are writing for very small audiences. Right. Exactly. They often have absolute gold dust. They have wonderful stories, fantastic statistics, uh, which they can make a lot out of because as I mean, a, a good friend of mine is Martin Kemp, who's the great Leonardo da Vinci scholar. Mm-hmm. And he said mm-hmm. to me one time. Uh, he said, Ross, you can be interesting. He said, I'm not allowed to be interesting. <laughs> I'm sort of the, the, he's the king. I'm the court jester. Or something uh, like and I can tell the funny stories and and speculate about things because I'm hoping uh, to have a, a wider readership. Uh, whereas if you're an academic in, you know, occupying that prestigious chair at the yeah. great university, uh, you're writing for a, a smaller group of experts. And mm-hmm. so I'm indebted to that work, uh, but I try to have fun with it. And so my training was as an academic and it maybe mm-hmm. took me a book or two to unlearn uh, <laughs> academic writing and uh, learn how to write a little bit more broadly for um, you know people who are interested in the material. And a lot of people are interested in the art of the 15th century, 16th oh, sure. century. Sure. Um, and so I, I, think, it, I want to share what I know and what other people have written about it with them in a way that they can understand and appreciate. Yeah, I think Martin sells himself short. I've seen him pop up in a, in a number of documentaries. And he seems he seems uh, delightful, very entertaining. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yes, I mean, his book on, you know, he's written the best book ever on Leonardo da Vinci, which is Marvelous Works of Nature and Man, published mm. in the 1980s, still in print. Mm. Um, and I find it really interesting and incredibly useful. But if you don't, uh, you know, if you haven't read much about Leonardo da Vinci, that's probably not the best place for you to start because right, right. Um, it is w- operating at a very high level, whereas I start a bit lower down on the uh, on the scale and hopefully yeah. can draw in more people. Yeah. Well, the, the details about Leonardo's costume, the different colors and how fastidious he was about his appearance and so forth, as well as how he was tasked with um, staging dramas with special effects and so forth. Those those elements really do a, a lot to carry the story. So, And that's one, one thing that maybe the average person who knows that he painted The Last Supper, the Mona Lisa, doesn't right. know that he was right. kind of a... He was the special effects guy for the right. Duke of Milan and then later for the French king yeah. and you know, made robots and, uh, and and things like that. And so um, it's and, and because we don't have these things anymore, our knowledge of the visual culture of Milan in the 1490s when he was making these pageants, he was sort of a, a costume designer, set director, opera director, <clears throat> uh, doing a real impresario and all, all of these things. Um, and so, yes, to he was doing those at the same time he was painting The Last Supper. So I really wanted to bring uh, that aspect of him to life as well. And, and desperately wanting to work on uh, munitions and siege engines and so forth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a sad irony to his, well, there are all sorts of ironies to his career. But one of them is that he went to Milan um, in 1482 when he was 30 years old in order to really to become an, a, a military engineer or at least a civil engineer. He wanted to do large scale projects which would uh, you know either build Milan up into a larger city, more hygienic city, um, or else allow Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan, to crush to a pulp anyone who challenged him <laughs> by designing things to blow yeah. up castles and and you know he did not want to paint. He reinvented himself when he went to Milan. But of course, peace broke out in the 1480s. <laughs> so he never got the call to do that. And then when war did break out in 1494, uh, sadly for him, uh, he had his uh, bronze that he was going to make this huge equestrian statue from. He had it expropriated mm. uh, to be turned into cannon. And he was not the guy who got to make the cannon, even though he had plans for a gigantic cannon. Yeah. And so, and, and that's when he, of course, gets the Last Supper commission because he has his dream commission taken away from him, which is this giant horse. 
and then is given a kind of compensation prize or a booby prize, which is the uh, uh, the you know painting the wall uh, uh, in a room where a band of friars eats their lunch every day. Right, it wasn't quite the same thing. <laughs> right, you know, Ross, we're we are we're recording in. Um, Grand Rapids, Michigan, in the states. Where are you aware of the horse? Um, I've got uh, got a friend in Grand Rapids who sent me a photo of that. Oh, oh yeah, I use in my talks when I uh, uh. Kathleen Marcaccio, uh, who um, uh, you know was taking a, a photograph of it with yeah. um, her husband in it, so I can see, <laughs> so I can show people the human scale of it. Yeah, just yeah. the colossus it was going to be. Yeah, yeah, that's th- very impressive. I think you need to come here and and, yes. and lecture on the horse. Don't, yes, and well, yeah. you know, uh, the pints are on us if you're able to make it. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ross, one of the things that both David and I, um, we both have led several student trips um, to to mainly Italy and Greece, um, and we're you know great proponents of study abroad and that kind of visceral experience. I, I think in the academy, at least in my institution, there's been a little bit of pushback. You know, the idea that well, since everything is so available digitally, can we justify the cost? You know, it, uh, and I'm I, I push for it and continue to push for it. But one of the things I'm we're both curious about is. You know, how would you answer that question? Because clearly your experience on the ground in Florence and in Rome, is, that kind of visceral nature of it comes across in your writing. And so like for your, your latest book, you know, how, you know, walking down the street of the booksellers, how does that influence the way you, you write and interpret? Oh, I mean, it, it is hugely important to me because of the fact that there's only so much looking at maps that you can do. I'm sure everyone's had this experience where you're going on holiday somewhere and you decide to go onto Google Street View to find out where your hotel is going to be or something like that. Yeah. And you can take a virtual stroll mm-hmm. up and down the street and down to the beach or something like that. And you get there and you find out that what you saw on Google Street View, useful as it is and interesting as it is, is just it, it's a fragment of what you um, experience when you're actually there. Because once you're breathing the air and your boots are on the ground, um, and you can smell things. And in a city like Florence or in large parts of Rome, what you see is exactly what they saw back in, in my case, the 14 and 1500s. I mean, Florence is very similar uh, in in its architecture, um, apart from the uh, Piazza della Repubblica, which is a 19th century creation. Otherwise, so much of Florence within what used to be the walls is the architecture that would have been there mm, right, in the right. 1400s and 1500s during the golden age of Florence. And there's no Google Street View or digital image that's going to give you the experience of walking from the steps of the Palazzo Vecchio, the town hall, up to the cathedral. And also, I mean, how can you appreciate no image will give you, not even drone shots of it, can give you the the sense of the scale of the cathedral mm-hmm, and the... Yeah. Uh, the might of the dome itself. Right. So it is, we live in a, we're, you know, we're blessed with all of the images that we have. Never before in history has it been possible to be so visually literate and to be able to look at uh, at ancient manuscripts digitally in high resolution, which is hugely um, uh, useful for you know someone like me in my most recent book. Uh, but there is still uh, no substitute for actually being physically present uh, Absolutely. And, um, and, you know, using the language and eating the food and right. <laughs> experiencing it in that way. Well, having the sore calves when you uh, walk down the steps of the <laughs> of the Duomo and then going for gelato and reflecting on the, the whole experience, it's it's really quite different. Well, I had a a good experience with my book on Michelangelo uh, because I found out where his studio had been uh, when he was working on uh, in in the Sistine Chapel in 1508 to 12. Um, The street is now gone because Mussolini bulldozed that area. (laughs) Um, But I was able to find out approximately where it was. And then I thought, I'll walk from here up to the front of St. Peter's to see how long that would have taken him each morning. And Mm. doing that, I realized, you know, it would have taken 15 minutes or something. But what struck me then was something that I probably wouldn't really have grasped just looking at it from a map 
or street view was that he, he would have walked past the giant pile of marble that he had quarried for his dream commission, which was the tomb right. of Julius II, right, which was right. taken away from him because he too, 10 years after Leonardo da Vinci was so disappointed in having his monumental sculpture of the, the bronze equestrian statue taken away from him and given the Last Supper, Le, uh, Michelangelo had something identical um, in 1508, when he lost his commission to do the tomb of Julius II, um, and instead was given the job of painting the ceiling <laughs> in the Sistine Chapel. And I realized he would have walked past that pile of marble that he had buried every day when he went to work. And they're taunting he would have him. Had his failure, exactly. Yes, his, right. His failure staring him in the face quite literally. Wow. Wow. It must have been very motivating. Does a man like Michelangelo need external motivation? I, I assume not, but this must have been uh, something really to drive him. And what a great detail. I mean, who thinks about, well, aside from you, um, Michelangelo's walk from his studio to, to, his, to, to his workplace, but how that would have kind of, uh, you know, colored his day every time he did. That, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's that sort of, you know, li literally the boots on the ground stuff that interests me. What was day to day life like back then? Um, what was it like to be alive in 1508 and living in Rome? Um, you know, what were the difficulties of living at that time? And uh, what were the pleasures of living at that time? And so it's that whole, I guess the way I think of each of my books is uh, they're sort of, uh, I don't know, time travel machines or something. I try mm -hmm. to take us back in time and really immerse us, give an immersive experience of the historical period, uh, which I think, you know, the period is interesting in and of itself. But the fact that it has produced people like Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo Brunelleschi and so forth, uh, just to me makes it that much more worthy of study. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Today's episode is brought to you by the good people at Hackett Publishing. With offices in Cambridge, Massachusetts and Indianapolis, Indiana, Hackett provides high quality, affordable, accessible translations and scholarship for all of your humanities needs. Jeff, what do you like about Hackett? I've used their texts in uh, my classroom for years now. In fact, I'm teaching class right now and we're, we're reading uh, Stanley Lombardo's translation of the Odyssey. And it's great. Uh, it threads that needle between being close to the Greek, but also very accessible to, to for the students. And that seems to be kind of what I found that Hackett offers kind of across the board. Yes. Um, attractive, affordable. Students love them. Yes. Very, very current. They, they know how to keep the idiom fresh, you yep. might say. In addition, they have a broad catalog of humanities offerings. Pretty much everything from philosophy to art to uh, Latin American studies, they, they really run the gamut. That's right. It's not just the Western tradition. It's all no. over. And they're, they're always coming out with new stuff all the time. Definitely. And we're so grateful that they are sponsoring this uh, popularization of the classics. Yeah. So how can you show some appreciation, listener, if you'd like to, and get yourself a great deal? Jeff, can you tell them? Yes. Um, all they have to do is go to hackettpublishing.com, H-A-C-K-E-T-T -T publishing.com, and you find what you want to want to purchase. You type in AN2021 into the coupon code, and you will get 20% off and free shipping on anything you order. That's amazing. 20% off, free shipping. The code is AN2021. Go to hackettpublishing.com. Check it out. This episode also brought to you by Ratio Coffee. Ratio Coffee, a company from Portland, Oregon, uh, comes from our good friend Mark Helwig. They have solved your home brewing needs. Uh, with the Ratio 6 and the Ratio 8 machines, you can brew professional, exquisite coffee right there on your kitchen countertop. Dave, what do you like about Ratio? Well, I love the beauty of the machines. There's nothing cheap or plasticky in how these things are put together. It's all uh, aluminum and wood. Beautiful accents, beautiful modern design. I'm not really a modern guy for the most part. You know, I like classical things when right. it comes to aesthetics. But this is an exception because this is a, a beautifully put together machine and it brews incredible coffee. It does. It's got this Fibonacci shower head that brings 200 degree Fahrenheit water down into the cone. It uh, allows the harsh odors and gases to escape into the biosphere. With the bloom stage. With the bloom, that's right. Yep. And then you go into brew and then deposit it into this industrial strength 
but not industrial looking, carafe is your delicious, sweet, tangy coffee. Yeah, in no time at all, you're about to have a great morning. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, I have the ratio six. I am never disappointed. When I hit that button, I know I'm there's great coffee on the way. Waiting down the line. Yeah. And listener, you can go to Ratio Coffee, R-A-T-I-O, coffee.com, R-A-T-I-O, and check out the ratio six. Enter our special coupon code exclusively for ad nauseum listeners, ANCO. What is that, Jeff? The ANCO. ANCO. That's the code. N-co, yep. Ad nauseum coffee. And you will get 15% off the ratio six. You won't regret it. This episode is also brought to you by the good people at Odd Ostra Roasters of Hillsdale, Michigan. Patrick Whalen and his crew there, they're roasting some delicious beans. That's Odd Ostra, A-D-A-S-T-R-A, roasters.com. Jeff, which blends do you like? I'm still drawn to the Tenebris, but everything I've tried from Odd Ostra, the Huehuetenango is great. Their poetry series, which they've sent us uh, a number of bags of yes. attractive, they come in attractive packaging. Mm-hmm. Um, everything I've tried, the I like the darker blends. Um, yeah, I do too. Yeah, it's and great. It's varied. It's interesting. Yes, Uh Every bag contains some delicious notes of coffee, and like you were saying, there's poetry on the outside. It's it's, it's really quite um, delightful. Yes. Now, ad nauseum listeners, you can score for yourself some of this great 80% or better on the coffee roasting scale brewed beans by going to oddostraroasters.com, A-D-A-S-T-R-A, roasters.com, and we have a coupon code there, right? We do. I believe this one is A-N-A-A. A-N-A-A. Yep. Enter that coupon code, get 10% off any order. And they have a monthly subscription service. Yes. So uh, don't hesitate. You will You will not be disappointed. Check it out. I, I assume you probably have read um, the Irving Stone, uh, the famous novel, Agony and Ecstasy. Yes, yes. And uh, I read that at the same time as I was reading um, Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling. And of course, in that novel, which I thought was wonderful, Bramante is the villain, right? Uh, he, he permeates the whole novel as the villain. and uh, But he looks quite a bit better in your Leonardo book. Uh, well, yes. I mean, I, I love that book a lot. And that's one of, I'm very fond of it because I probably read it at the first, uh, for the first time when I was 13 or 14. And it was, mm. you know, it's a thickish book. And yes, um, it and another book of sort of equivalent length that I read around probably the same year, an adult book I felt uh, that required a commitment of time and also linguistic skill to get through. It was Dracula by Bram Stokes. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. So I read those two books, not back to back, but they were really the first adult books I read or the first books probably written for not someone who was 13 mm. or 14, whatever mm. I, I was at the time. So I'm extremely fond of it. Um, and he did a lot of research uh, stone for it. Uh, and but Bramante traditionally was the enemy in because for for Michelangelo he was the enemy he was the one um, who was trying to thwart his plan to build the tomb um, and he was the one who was maybe going to have him buried in the foundations of uh, of Saint Peter as if um, Michelangelo crossed him in some way but of course that we know now five hundred years later that all of that was in Michelangelo's paranoid imagination mm. and Bramante wasn't actually that villainous. I mean, I love that idea of having a villain uh, in in a book, uh, but Bramante doesn't quite fit the bill. And in fact, he was uh, a, a great artist in his own right um, and someone that uh, was, as you say, very helpful to Leonardo da Vinci and a very good friend of his. And apparently was uh, the model, you argue, f- uh, quite quite persuasively for one of the apostles in the painting. That's right. Um, with uh, the, the Last Supper, I think the most interesting thing that anyone said about it when it was unveiled uh, in 1498 or, or for the, the next decades afterwards, the most interesting thing anyone said is that it said, when I look at the Last Supper, I see not just Christ and the 12 apostles, but I see uh, the eminent courtiers at the Duke of <laughs> Milan's court in Milan. Um, and so that was all I needed to try to identify who these eminent courtiers were. Um, and Bramante is a, you know, he was the architect. He was rebuilding the church in which uh, we find uh, you know, in the, the monastic con- the complex in which we find the Last Supper, Santa Maria della Grazia, um, he was c- reconstructing it at that time. And therefore, 
uh, and he was a friend of Leonardo, so I thought he has to be in it. And we happen mm. to have a good visual record of Bramante because of his fame. He was painted twice by Raphael. He appears on coins, um, and there are various posthumous portraits of him as well based on those. Um, and so uh, I decided that the guy on the, the farthest Bartholomew, the farthest left, uh, was was Bramante. And mm. um, in the book, I juxtaposed the, an image, a known image of Bramante with Leonardo's sketch. And it, I, I, I do think I'm right in that case, that it is um, almost certainly Bramante. Yeah, and Jeff, you described it as a what a good historical mystery when we were discussing this ahead oh, yeah. of time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm 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 a, I'm a sucker for you know a character who stumbles into a, an old library and finds some tome, which you know um, the information within will it, within will it will change the world. And um, I mean that my, my some of my favorite parts of your um, your more your most current book are these these guys who are going around to these monasteries and finding these moldering piles of, of books and, and finding these gems in there. It's incredible. In some ways, it's incredible that anything survives at all. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I find that one of history's most interesting stories or most, and, and these uh, people, these manuscripts, hun, manuscript hunters that you're describing were really heroic because they would go out, you know, they would travel across the Alps because they knew that, maybe counterintuitively, the wisdom of the ancient Romans was going to be found not in Italy, because anything in Italy probably had been found at that point, but more likely it had left Italy um, in uh, the 6th, 7th century when the Lombards came, the mm. barbarian tribe who stayed in Italy. Um, and so uh, learned men fled, and much knowledge ended up then, of course, in the British, in Ireland and British Isles and the Anglo-Saxon missionaries and the Irish missionaries then came across to the continent um, and armed with their script uh, and their conviction that every monastery should have a good library. And so this is where the great scriptoria of the, you know, under Charlemagne around the year 800 and in the century that followed, these scriptoria in the monasteries reproduced works that were probably just two or three, um, how would I describe it, two or three uh, books removed from the ancient Roman papyrus. So that, right. wow. uh, yeah. when you talk about the survival, uh, for a book to survive, it had to get through a bottleneck, fr through the, uh, the bottleneck of morality, first of all, because the Christian scribes had to deem it in, say, the year 400 or 500, worthy of being copied um, if it was a pagan work. And then secondly, it had to get through the bottleneck of technology. It had to be converted from papyrus to parchment. So, because papyrus copied in, say, the year 50 ACE wasn't going to survive into the year 1000. And so no. it needed to be copied. Someone had to copy it. And of course, those copies then, as uh, we're saying, ended up in France, for the most part, in France and Germany. And this is where these Italian manuscript hunters like Poggio Bracciolini uh, mm -hmm. would go to uh, and to blag their way into monastery libraries and bargain with the monks to see what they could take out, what they could copy, um, and just have a look through the shelves to see where was the quintillion that we'd been looking for. <laughs> Everyone's been looking for a quintillion for 500 years, and there's a, you know, no one's seen a complete and whole copy of it. And of course, Poggio in 1416 finally discovers it. Yeah. That, that that actually surprised me in, in your book is I didn't realize that people were were so desperate to find quintillions. Um, they'd known about it, but it had been lost for so long. And when it was found, it was this this massive, massive deal. Yeah. In some ways, it stands to reason that they wanted to find him because he was the great writer on rhetoric, the great teacher, right. probably the greatest teacher of Imperial Rome. And so if we as Italians as Florentines in the 1400s want to improve our lives. If we want to educate our children better, if we want to learn how to make better speeches, if we learn, want to learn how to conduct more judicious wars or have better political assemblies, Quintilian's the man who's going to teach us how to do it, or so they believed. Hmm. And so they thought, if we can only find him, uh, we, you know, you know, this will be the second coming of Quintilian, and <laughs> he will he will save us and hmm. will help us, you know, make Italy uh, what it was under the Roman Republic and Roman Empire and resuscitate um, it once again. So it's one of the endearing things about the 1400s is this 
passion for learning they had that they would risk their lives uh, to, you know, travel hundreds and hundreds of miles through Europe looking looking for books. We take mm. for granted that we can get a copy of a book. We can download one almost instantly, or we can right. go to a bookstore and they can probably get one for us the next day. Uh, but uh, there, uh, you know, in those days, uh, manuscripts were extremely rare. I'm intrigued that the largest private uh, collection in Europe in um, until his death in 1437 was that of Niccolo Niccoli in Florence, mm. who had only 800 books. Mm, yeah, I checked recently and the average kindergarten, sorry, not kindergarten, primary school in Britain has to have 1300 books. Oh my goodness. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, primary school kids in Britain have more uh, access to knowledge than Niccolo Niccoli, who was a very well-resourced and extremely erudite collector in uh, the early 15th century. And so that just speaks to the paucity mm-hmm. of opportunity for learning and getting knowledge. And that's what drove Poggio Bracciolini and the manuscript hunters out of Florence and into the German hinterland to try to find these books that they knew existed, uh, but hadn't seen for centuries. Hmm. So I don't know if you care to speculate a little bit, but it, it seems to me, and, and I can't demonstrate it, that the greater access uh, to knowledge hasn't really led most people to have the same depth of understanding. And I wonder if there's any relation, the, the statistic you cite, the average primary school has 1300 volumes, but the largest collection was 800 uh, at that time. Why do we seem to be less uh, deep readers and and less um, concerned about really trying to master uh, an an element of human knowledge? I mean, that is a depressing thing to speculate on. uh, (laughs) (laughs) uh, But, you know, if we were to go back, uh, say, to the second half of the 1500s, certain people uh, such as uh, the guy I talk about in the bookseller of Florence, Vespasiano de Bisticci, what he would say is that the problem is the printing press has just made knowledge too widely available. Mm. And if it's cheap and if it's widely available, you know, I think we now think of that as a good thing, that there is an access for information. But certain scholars in the 1400s believed this was not a good thing, partly because they said incorrect information was being spread. In other words, fake news, Right, 15th century style, um, because error-filled volumes were being put out. Uh, but then, secondly, um, it was uh, because it was so available, people took it for granted. And I'm not sure if that's what we could say about what's happened in our society. That we, I think, there is still a hunger for knowledge. Um, and so, I, w- I wouldn't want to be too depressed about that. The state. I mean, the fact that your podcast is thriving. Uh, I think indicates the desire people have to learn about the past, about literature, about the classical world, and engage in that way. Mm. Uh, but I suppose it's it's the case that there are other distractions, and people that's um, true. <laughs> depressed on you know back in the days BC when I could fly in airplanes. Um, I used to be you know back in the nineties. I would see everyone was reading a book. Someone would have a paperback and. They right. See what they were reading nowadays, they're, um, you know, they're, they're listening to music, which is fine, or they're watching movies on iPads or on the in-flight entertainment system, things like that. So I think people were just too easily diverted. Mm. Whereas Niccolo Niccoli in his eight hundred books <laughs> didn't have much else to occupy himself, and right? so yeah. he he read each of those books very carefully. Hmm. I always take a book, and then I feel guilty if I end up watching the in-flight entertainment, which, <laughs> which does happen, I'll confess. I, was, I have a rule with myself that until I order my first drink, I read. Uh, yeah, that's drink. good. Yeah, you have to build in little rules like that in order to maintain a, you know, a sense of sanity. And uh, speaking of which, uh, what does a typical day of writing and research look like for you, if you can share that with us and our listeners? Right. Well, uh, it what I'm sitting at the moment in an eight by ten shed in the um, the bottom of my garden, um, and this is where I spend uh, this these days. And without without traveling, this is where I spend my days because I sit uh, sit out here um, and research both with the books on my shelves 
here and in the house, and also through the wonderful resources that the internet does make available, such as um, these manus- digitally um, right. reproduced manuscripts that you can click a couple of links and bring up in full color illuminated manuscripts of the uh, the 15th century, which is wonderful. Um, so it, my day starts uh, not all that early. I like to read a, a newspaper or something before I start. And then I come out here probably about 10 o'clock uh, and, uh, and do my writing, uh, which, uh, and I then take a break at, uh, for lunch, go for a walk after lunch almost every mm-hmm. day. I live close to a 2,000 acre park. And so I go for a walk there. I come back um, and work for another couple of hours before my wife uh, then comes out. She used to have a bell that she rang. <laughs> <laughs> Stopped using it um, <laughs> when this bell was to tell me it's time to come in and help cooking dinner. Ah, uh, did it make you feel Pavlovian, right? <laughs> time to come back to the 21st century. Uh, but then for years, I tried to get her to, to get rid of it. But then she um, found out that the neighbors could actually hear it and realize <laughs> that she was summoning me like this. So she was a bit embarrassed by it. So the, it's gone into storage, the bell. Uh, but yeah, I then go inside. Uh, and That's a uh, charming story. I have to interrupt that. Thoughts and things like that. That's just such a charming story. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Now, Ross, has, you, has your um, your travels and your research uh, gotten you into like the Vatican libraries of the Laurentian or to look at these uh, in person? And Yeah. Uh, well, I've been able to get behind the scenes access to various things. I've been able to go into the dome, for example, and off the, you know, I'm sure many of your listeners have climbed it. And if you, you know, you ascend the stairs, this very claustrophobic experience of climbing up oh, yes. between the two shells. Uh, but there, you'll notice there, as you go up, there are little doors. And I've been able to go through mm. those little doors and see uh, some of the internal aspects of the, oh, man. Uh, yeah. the, the dome, which is really exciting. And also, yeah, I mean, the state archives uh, in Florence, uh, I've worked in, and the National Library, which is on the Arno, uh, big neoclassical building. Um, and there's something extremely exciting about looking at uh, uh, manuscripts that were in the hand of, you know, a priest who's keeping track of uh, what uh, what his meals cost that day uh, in the year 1455 or mm. something like that. Something you really, and again, maybe that's an argument in favor of travel because yes, you can see it digitally, but there's something really exciting about being in the presence of the handwriting of someone who's been dead for 450 years. Yes. And in many ways that, you know, that experience of witnessing that brings them back to life and brings that period to life for who's, whoever is lucky enough to look at it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I've also, I should say, been in the Sistine Chapel when I could see the floor. And anyway, (laughs) (laughs) don't see the floor. No, no. The floor is full of people. Right. The floor is actually very beautiful. Lovely marble tile work. Mm. Right. Well, the same, um, the same trip I was telling you about where I was using my copy of your work, Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling. We had one of our students, we, we were able to get all of them to go out the proper door, except one who went off to the left. And we couldn't, of course, reunite for another three hours because <laughs> you have a circuitous route from that point on. Do you, do you have a f- contact via mobile phone or cell phone or something right. like that? Or it becomes it essential. Like, yes. Yeah. Right. So. How do you select your subjects? Because has anyone written something on on Botticelli? He seems like a real likely candidate. Um, And I don't think Botticelli has had that sort of treatment where, I mean, there are probably monographs, uh, you know, Birth of Venus and things like that, but I'm not sure. The great expert on Botticelli is Ronald Lightbone, who Hmm. is, but he's an, an academic or, yeah, he's probably retired now, but he... Um, is the, you know, traditionally has been the world expert on him for decades. Um, But obviously he's writing, you know, for a very different market from what, from who I write for. So, yeah, I mean, interesting you should say that because I have thought of Botticelli and I actually have a lot of notes on him Hmm. uh, from when I have been kicking around ideas about what to do with him. Um, And one of the interesting things that he did was his, illustrations for the divine comedy right I, mean, so mm. I thought somehow you know dante and botticelli 
brought together in some way might make for uh, an interesting book at some time. But I haven't Any quite, uh, I haven't done enough research into it right. to, uh, to quite figure out how, or quite to achieve liftoff without one just <laughs> yet. And he fell under the spell of Savonarola for a while too, mm-hmm. which is uh, so shocking. But yeah. And what was, what was lost, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's sad to think that he may well have burned some of his own paintings. And hmm. right, 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 right. Yeah, I've also noticed that. And if you write a book like this, you can you can use this. Um, that in his adoration of the of the Magi, he has a, a self portrait in there. And to me, he's always been a, a dead ringer for Roger Daltrey from the Who. Um, <laughs> he's a good looking guy, you know, square jawed, ready to launch in, launch into a, a into an epic howl from the stage, right? <laughs> Good rock star hair. He did get good rock star <laughs> hair. It was great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have you had, have you had um, uh, like uh, ideas that you've pursued and you get to a point and just say, oh, this is not working or I'm, I'm going to set it aside and, or just, uh, and haven't gone back to? Um... Fortunately, not yet. Uh, okay. That, although yeah, I'm always apprehensive of that happening because, you know, your worst fear is you spend, uh, you know, a year doing research into something uh, and then realize, and maybe the editor then or the publisher says, no, no, we we're not interested in this. Or what could also happen is someone else publishes that book, mm. and oh, right. um, and 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 therefore there isn't really going to be a market for it. Uh, so touch wood that has not happened to me as as yet. Uh, but it, having said that, I do have these ideas like the Botticelli ones, which are just in the back of my mind that I've thought about periodically um and and may take up at some point mm. okay okay all right can we ask what you're working on now i i'm uh, in the the sort of holding pattern that i end up in when i finish a book um and i should say i've been finished this one for almost a year so i've been in the holding pattern for a time um but what always happens is when i finish a book i don't I have no idea what the next one is going to be. Mm-hmm. And in fact, it will often take me at least a year to come up with the next idea and begin mm-hmm. developing it. Um, and so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm researching a number of things and possibilities and just thinking and, and doing a lot of reading to try to figure out what I might want to start uh, thinking about seriously in terms of a book. So mm-hmm. maybe if by Christmas I don't have the at least the germ of an idea uh, say six months from now, I might start to get a little bit anxious, but gotcha. at the moment I'm, re- I'm relaxing and enjoying not having to, you know, produce my 1500 to 2000 words a day. Right, 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 right. right. Just waiting for that bell to ring. Right. So this, <laughs> it's time for supper. Just saying that, uh, yes, it can't ring too soon these days, but uh, I, 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 I'm sometimes deaf to it. I have to say, uh. <laughs> I'm engaged in work. Uh, Florence is such a charming city. I, I went there first in 2004 and my wife uh, went at the time. We were there in June, which of course means it was just an absolute madhouse in terms of space. Even even though it was so crowded, it still made such a fine impression upon us. And I've been able to visit in January when, of course, it's, it's uh, very pleasantly empty. And do you have favorite parts of the city? You must know it really well based on your travels. Yeah, I, I do. I think my favorite neighborhood, I suppose, is Santo Spirito, just uh, the south side of the Arno, which even mm. at this time of year, say in high summer, is a little bit uh, less crowded uh, than you know the, the right bank, the north bank of the Arno, mm-hmm. um, because fewer people come down to it, fewer people venture beyond where the Palazzo Pitti is. And so if you go south of that, um, you begin to find little neighborhood cafes and restaurants, coffee shops, things like that. And you can pop into Santo Spirito, which is a Brunelleschi designed church. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and you know, I've sometimes I've just popped in on a whim and the choir has been singing and things like mm-hmm. that. So you get these sublime moments which are uh, almost accidental which happen seem to happen all the time in Florence and maybe in hmm. Italy more generally where you get these wonderful aesthetic experiences which you know aren't in the guidebook and you weren't, weren't expecting or weren't looking for when you got up in the morning is it Santo Spirito isn't there an early Michelangelo in there as well isn't that that the crucifix yes right yeah absolutely well done yes is yeah. uh, 
I'm I, I should say I'm not entirely convinced it's uh oh there's some controversy over that yeah yeah it's there is I mean there are good arguments for it being uh, by him he certainly worked there and he certainly uh, knew the um, uh, the monks uh, and he may well have done it for them but it just it there's a bit of an irony to me uh, in that he studied anatomy at Santo Spirito and that cru- crucified Christ does not look like the work of an anatomist. It, oh, uh, mm. so it's, yeah, it's yeah. not quite, it's not Michelangelo-esque, but it's difficult to compare to anything he's done because it's in wood and we're used to seeing him in marble. Um, right. So it's not necessarily um, a, a medium which he enjoyed working in, or maybe it's not a medium he had a great facility uh, for working in. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So I, I myself have only just a, a couple of more questions and then maybe Jeff has a, a couple if that's okay. Um, this is one actually that, that, that Jeff inspired, but have you, have you gotten any pushback from academic circles? So, you know, we're both academics of a type, but we're, we're trying to, in our own little way, uh, popularize and extend the interest in the classics. Do you get pushback from academic critics and how do you respond when that happens? Um, not directly. Um, but uh, I do have uh, friends, I have quite a few friends in academia uh, and in this particular area in 15th and 16th century. Um, and they always tell me they defend my reputation. Oh, <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> Which is me. And they, they say, well, the, you know, if, if someone is, is uh, criticizing me, it's because they have, haven't read the book. I think my hmm. defense, what I would say in my defense against someone who um, I'm not sure if I could be seen as a, a vulgarizer or something like that. No. Uh, I'm a popularizer, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, but my defense is, uh, you know, uh, just the market I'm writing for. And what, what a very gratifying thing that something I would throw in the face of an academic who is disdaining me. I would say, ah, you need students. And so many people have come up to me in the last 20 years and said, I went into art history after mm. reading some of your works. Yes. And so I see myself as uh, I'm the, the sort of feeder school for the series. Right. Absolutely. Of, uh, Without a art doubt. History, architectural history departments of fine universities. So yes. I think I think there's room for both. Um, I, I, I think, you know, I would uh, sort of maybe stand by the academic credentials. I footnote everything. Sure, uh, sure. In, in my books to try to, um, you know, partly to give credit where credit is due, but also partly just if people want further reading, uh, they, they, they can try to truffle out these articles or books that I got the information from. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's excellent. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, Ross, I, just, I have one last, last question for you. Um, uh, just kind of curious about um, your own when you when you started to kind of write in this more popularizing way, or as you continue to do so, uh, models that you've looked for. Uh, I know that me personally, when I have students in my classes who are you know, interested in this kind of stuff and they don't want to dive into that academic tome, I will broadly, talking about kind of history, I will often recommend uh, two authors to them, yourself and uh, Eric Larson, who's also, I think, does is a genius at taking complicated things and making them very um, not you know, like novels. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you're familiar with his work or, you know, other models that you might have. Um, his, I think it's his most recent uh, about World War II, where he, you yes. know, he's so convincing with uh, uh, Devil in the White City, just bringing Chicago at that time to life. Yes. And then yeah. he moves forward uh, 50 years uh, to a different country to write um, in the Splendid in the Vile about Britain in World War II. Right. Uh, so, yeah, he's a remarkable writer and has, I think, what I aspire to, which is to have things factually correct um, and also interesting facts, uh, uh, which are then told in uh, a sort of fluent and readable way so that people can learn something. I think it's a combination of learning about something that maybe you didn't know you were interested in, uh, and but also enjoying it and finding yeah. that... Um, you know, this, I, I, in some ways, I guess I began my career, my writing career as a novelist because I published two novels. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and so I've remained, I guess, uh, this hybrid of an academic and a novelist. And, but I've, the mashup is, is not novels and it's not academic work. It's a sort of history that reads like novels. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So, so do you have a favorite place in Rome? Uh, same question, but different context now. 
or or is it more along the lines of uh, what one of my students traveling with me said? Um, Looks like Bernini has touched up everything here. Can't, can't we? Can't we see anything original? He he put his hands all over everything. So <laughs> exactly. Well, so I'll I'll steal that from him because that's <laughs> that's quite a good observation. Um, I think one of my favorite places is Santa Maria della Pace. It, it's easily reached because of the fact that you know it's not all that far from the Pantheon, and you can walk there quite quickly mm -hmm. um, and easily. And it's, it, again, it's almost, you have the feeling that you're in a neighborhood as you come into it. But the, the Santa Maria della Pace was, the cloister was built by Bramante, Irving Stone's villain. Uh, and it's one of the first things he did when he came to Rome. But the reason it's really interesting is you can, it's usually open, it's free, and uh, uh, you can go in and see Raphael close up. So you can see Raphael in the Vatican, mm -hmm. in the Raphael apartments, along with 500 people who can cram <laughs> into that room. That's <laughs> awful. How many yeah. people can it's like, you know, how many people can fit inside a VW? <laughs> fit inside the Stanza della Segnatura. And so you can't really appreciate the work that easily. You're quite close to it, but it's not uh, a holy experience, shall we say. Whereas right. in Santa Maria della Pace, it is, uh, you know, Our Lady of Peace, because you go in, it's very quiet and peaceful. There might just be five or six other people in the church. Uh, and Raphael is there on the walls, and uh, you can almost touch it, but you can see uh, with, through the, the movement and the vibrant colors mm. that he's given it, why all roads in Rome led to Raphael, and why mm. everyone wanted to study with him, and why every patron wanted to have a Raphael, because they're absolutely stunning. Uh, and the fact that it's largely undiscovered just makes it that much more special. Mm. Right, right. Well, I think we better wrap up and give you back the rest of your evening. And uh, we are so grateful. For the bell, but it hasn't rung yet. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are so grateful uh, for you taking the time to meet with us and answer our curious and sometimes, in my case, at least rambling questions. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. And, if, we, and uh, if you're willing, we'd love to have you back on after after the next book. And, right. And, uh, and continue Absolutely. This. I'd love yeah. to. Great. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Ross. Thank Great. you. My pleasure. Right. Thanks so much, guys. Take, Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Well, that wraps up this week's episode. Jeff, are you as uh, nerded out as I am? Oh, super. <laughs> fa I talk about a fanboy no moment. No kidding. Right? That was great. There's, I don't know if there is another individual that you and I both uh, admire. I mean, an academic, right? And right. Or a writer that you and I admire equally. No. This it, is the guy. It, this is the guy. And so, so excited. Um, yeah, that that was that was fascinating. There was so much more that both you and I want, I'm sure, want to ask him. I'm going to be oh. grabbing my lapels, right? Yeah. <laughs> and tell people. People, hey, did you know I interviewed Ross, Ross King? King. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to say, who? <laughs> Ross, the Ross. Oh, right. right. Yeah, I got to talk to him for an hour. Yeah, that was that was fabulous. We, and we got to have him back on someday. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Delightful. But we got to wrap up this episode. We do. Right. Yes. Yeah. So we need to uh, say thank you to a, a few folks. Uh, to Mishka. Our intrepid engineer, as always, um, uh, especially with these interviews, uh, she keeps us on our toes and, and uh, figures out all the, the tech issues. The tech issues, right. right. So we don't lose any of this valuable material. Right. We want to say thank you also to Ken Tamplin, who has his own vocal academy. You should check that out online, How to Sing Better Than Anyone Else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, T-A-M-P-L-I-N. Scott Van Zen, the fabulous guitarist who provides a lot of the intro and outro music check him out as well and dave you want to tell us about the the moss method before we get out of here i would like to absolutely you know as uh, mentioned on previous episodes i'm leaving academia this fall i'm going to become fully digital online so i hope to be able to put up a lot of greek and latin content uh, with myself in front of the camera as well as don't worry i'm getting to moss method as well as jeff and i stepping out in front of the camera to record ad nauseum in the vomitorium in yes. the studio yes so very soon you can watch all of our ridiculous hijinks in person so the moss method is a way for you to learn the greek language attic greek you can study plato aristotle demosthenes ionic uh, herodotus and homer and so forth go to mossmethod.com it's self-paced expert accessible and frankly inexpensive yes and it will take you from a neophyte to erudite that's the catchphrase in a short time who wouldn't want to go from neophyte to erudite exactly exactly jeff what's on tap for next week next week we have uh, another interview we're interviewing um our good friend and uh, former colleague and mentor ken bratt 
and we're going to have a, a fascinating discussion about the archaeology of ancient uh, Philippi. Did you say Ken Bratt or Paul Blart? It, <laughs> Paul Blart is later in the schedule. Okay. <laughs> Ken Bratt. Ken Bratt, yes. So Paul and the archaeology of Philippi, because this is something Ken knows a lot about. He does, yes. Himself being an archaeologist. Right, and the Paul you just mentioned, not Paul Blart. Okay. All right, all right. And Dave, I think you got our gustatory parting shot this week? I do have the gustatory parting shot, and I think it's apropos of Florence, the city that we talked about with the fabulous Ross King. Let's hear it. Here it comes. It comes from Scott Westerfeld, who said, quote, The best way to know a city is to eat it. Cannot disagree. All right. Thanks for listening. Thank you.